The, the title of my message this afternoon is Not of Corruptible Seed. The title of the message this afternoon is Not of Corruptible Seed. And the two verses we're going to focus there in 1 Peter 1, or the two sections of verses we're going to focus on there in 1 Peter 1, where I got the title of this message, is there in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. And then if we just skip down to verse 22. It says, seeing that ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, seeing that ye love one another with, pure, with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So in this foundational, I guess, series, I, I, I didn't plan to name it a series of sermons, but in this next, uh, this is three of five sermons that I'm focused on just kind of setting up the foundation of what our faith is. You know, we first looked at salvation and the eternal security and the once saved, always saved, and the fact that, you know, Jesus died on the cross once for us. And then we looked at baptism and how it just fills you with the Spirit to walk into newness of life. And then we see here that, you know, this is just a backing of that. And we'll think the focus of today's sermon is to not only set up the previous two, uh, or uh, back up the previous two sermons, but then set up the rest of the ministry or work that we'll be doing for the Lord and that we're going to continue to do in the Lord. And the reason it's not of corruptible seed is because the goal of today's message is not to preach uh, to you from the world's perspective why in the English-speaking language we use the King James, why it's necessary to have the Word of God preserved or the inspired Word of God if we were to speak those languages, but why there's only one word. But the, uh, the purpose behind this is, not, uh, is to show you from the Word of God that the King James is the preserved Word of God. Because there's an attack on the Word of God today and the focus of it is that next week's sermon is, is going to be dealing with soul winning. And after that, we're going to be dealing with some of the harder doctrines that come from the Word of God. And the challenge is that if you look at any other versions of the Bible or any other ways of people uh, you know, perceiving the Word of God, they water down or they want to uh, place doubt in the mind of the believer that this is not the Word of God. But the Bible is very specific that we can't have salvation, we can't have uh, the Holy Spirit, we can't walk in newness of life, we can't do great things for the Lord if the seed is corrupted. You know, there we see there in 1, 1 Peter 1, 22, he says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. And we see there it says, ye have purified your souls. Well, how do you purify your souls? If you read this in context, we're not purifying our souls. We've been purified, or we purify our souls through the faith in Jesus Christ. And then it says, in obeying the truth. Well, you can only have one absolute truth. Through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. So in order to love one another, we have to have a pure heart. And then we see this here. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God, and we know that Jesus is the word, which liveth and abideth forever. And see, it all packs up and ties with, you know, once saved, always saved. I love the end of uh, 1 Peter 1, 4, where it says, to an inheritance incorruptible. See, our inheritance is incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. I love that. It doesn't fade away. You know, one of the things that you get if you get a watered down version of the word is that you're going to start to get uh, uh, mistakes or omissions or you won't see anything. Even if, uh, let's say that I took this, this uh, Bible right now, the King James, but I decided that instead of preserving it and reprinting a new version as this one got older or buying a new Bible, I decided to make copies of this. Well, one of the challenges that would happen is, is I made more copies of a copy, it would start to fade away. 
But see, the Bible tells us that it never fades away, and that's why it's, it, it's ingrained in our soul. It's ingrained through the Spirit, through the Word of God. And there's so much that, we could, that could be said about the incorruptible seed. But today I'm just going to focus on how the Bible specifically addresses this, and how the Bible moves, and how the Bible cleanses, not only to the purifying of eternity, but also to the purifying of the flesh and how we address society. So a couple of things here, I really wanted to just drive this point in. So the only thing outside of uh, uh, the Bible besides what I'm going to say here is I am going to give you the, the several definitions of the word corruption. So we just get an idea of what it means to be corrupted, to be in the flesh. You know, we see that corruption is the act of corrupting or the state of being corrupt or putrid. You know, have you ever uh, smelled something that smells putrid? You know, the putrid is not something that is fresh. Something that's bad. Have you ever left, uh, you know, one of the mistakes we made, my wife and I, when we first got married, was we would buy food just for her and I. And, uh, you know, we would buy as if we had a big family. And I remember one time we left a bunch of potatoes uh, in, the, uh, in the pantry for a long time. And then we went in there to get the potatoes. And I don't know if you know this, but when potatoes go bad, they liquefy. And little flies come out. But the, bit, the worst thing about it is the putrid smell that you get from old potatoes. And that's what this is talking about is it's just a corruption. It's a destruction, right, of the natural form of bodies by the separation of the component parts or by the disorganization in the process of putrefication. It's uh, putrid matter, like pus. Have you ever seen pus? It's disgusting. It's putrescence, a foul state uh, occasioned by putrefication. Uh, we also see that it, ha it has to do with depravity or wickedness or perversion or deter uh, deteriori uh, deterioration of moral principles, loss of purity or integrity, debasement, taint, or tendency to a worse state, impurity, deprivation, debasement, bribery. So, you know, it's when you, uh, you're trying to uh, corrupt the outcome of something through bribery. In law, it's to taint or the impurity of blood, uh, and the consequence of an act of uh, treason or felony uh, by which a person is disabled to inherit lands from an ancestor, uh, nor can retain those in possession, nor transmit them by descendant to their heirs. Or if there's corruption in the legal matter. And for us, if there's corruption in the gospel, you know, it says here by which a person is disabled to inherit lands, we can inherit eternity if there's corruption in the gospel. So if there's corruption in the word of God, then the gospel then will by, there, by, uh, by proxy or by association be uh, corrupt. And so we have to take a look at that and make sure that we have the incorruptible word of God, the infallible, inerrant word of God, and that we believe this by faith and that we're willing to stand on it no matter what because it, is, it does make a difference. It's a difference of matter of life and death, and I'm talking about eternal life. And eternal death. And if we're going to preach on soul winning, if we're going to preach on uh, fit, uh, cleaning up our lives, if we're going to preach on praying, if we're going to preach on memorizing, if we're going to preach on raising our families, if we're going to preach on uh, addressing society, we better know that we're dealing with the entire truth because we're going to be dogmatic. We're going to be radical. We're going to stand on this no matter what. It's going to be black and white. And so we have to make sure that we have God's word and that it's the incorruptible word of God. And one of the ways that you can do this, it's very easy. If you don't have any background as to how the word of God came about, you know, in the King James and, you know, you don't have all the history and you haven't done that, you know, when it was presented to me that the King James was it, you know, I started to read it and a few things that stood out. Number one, I couldn't find error in it. Number two, it edified me. But number three is as you read other versions, you start to see the decay or some of the the doubt or confusion that it leaves and it causes. And so that's the real important way to really notice that. But let's go ahead and let's get into the, the crux of this message. You know, what does the Bible say about corruption? You know, well, let's go to Leviticus 22. Go to Leviticus 22. And the reason that, we cho that I chose Leviticus 22 is, number one, it, it talks about corruption. But number two, it's, it starts out with Moses giving uh, the, uh, the, Levi, uh, the Levitical law. To, the, to Aaron and his sons. And, you know, we know that Jesus is an high priest. He is the eternal high priest, and we're going to show that here in the Bible. It says, 
And the Lord spake unto Moses in verse 1, Leviticus 22, verse 1 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel, and that they profane not the holy name in those things which they hallow unto me. And then he says, I am the Lord. So this is God talking to Moses. He says, look, speak unto to Aaron and his sons about the things that they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to separate themselves, right? And it says, say unto them, whosoever he be of all your seed among your generations that goeth unto the holy things, which the children of Israel hallow unto the Lord, having his uncleanness upon him, that shall, soul shall be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. And so the Bible tells us there, you know, we see a, we can tie it to spiritual where we cannot go into the presence of the Lord in our spirit unclean and, um, and uh, because the Lord will cut us off. And so we see here that even in the Levitical laws, there would be a cutoff if they were unclean because the Lord is the only one that can purify. But there, he, he expected them to have a certain level of cleanness before he could purify the spirit. And we're, you know, we're not going to go into all that, but if you go in and read Leviticus 21 and 22, you'll see that. If you go skip down to verse number 9, it says, They shall therefore keep mine ordinance, lest they bear sin for it, and die therefore. If they profane it, I, the Lord, do sanctify them. And so see, the Lord is the one that sanctifies them. He says, they, but they need to keep mine ordinance, lest they bear sin for it, and die for it. Meaning, I love this picture of salvation by faith. Because it's, look, if they're not keeping my ordinance, if it's not by faith alone, and then it's, if it's not by the way that I've written in my word, then they're going to bear the sin. And Romans 4 tells them that, it's, that if we have to do it by our works, it's counted to our debt, Romans 4, 4. Uh, you know, Leviticus 22, then go down to 20, verse 25, it says, Neither from a stranger's hand shall you offer the bread of your God of any of these, because their corruption is in them and blemishes be in them, they shall not be accepted for you. See, that's a picture of salvation right there. That's a picture of the incorruptible, because if there's any corruption, then it's not going to be accepted of us. You know, we can't get into heaven if we have an incorruptible belief, I mean, a corrupted belief in Jesus Christ. If, we, if we're corrupted by the Word of God or a perversion, if we're corrupted by the false Jesus of the world that they try to... Uh, get you to believe on that's not the Jesus of the Bible, specifically the Jesus of the King James. This is a case for the King James Bible for the English-speaking language. You know, because if you, and, I, and I, I really was, but then I thought, I just want to focus on the King James. You know, you can, I can give you verse after verse after verse in the perversions where they just get rid of strong doctrine, where they get rid of the salvation of Jesus Christ, where they, you know, uh, get rid of the uh, the the, the miracle that was the virgin birth that, you know, attack the deity or the, or the godship or the, or the sonship of Jesus Christ. There's just so many issues with all that. But if we look at just what the Bible says about corruption, you know, the Lord doesn't want us to be corrupt in his presence. Let's go to 2 Kings 23. And we're, we're, we're going to be dealing with Josiah. And I love the, the verses that Josiah deals with all the corruption in the land. You know, he was a young king. He started uh, his, his reign at the age of eight. But the thing that stands out for me, he's one of my favorite characters in the Bible, is that, you know, he was godly raised. He was trained up in the way that he should go. But he had not, uh, nobody had ever read him the word of God. And then as he got older, he had done some great things for God. But shortly after the, the word of the Lord was found and was read to him, we're going to cover that. Man, he really made some serious changes. So how do we address society? We address it with the pure word of God. You know, there is power in the word. There is power in God's uh, son, Jesus Christ, because it says in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And we see this, and go to uh, 2 Kings 23. We're going to be there in verse 1. 2 Kings 23, verse 1, it says, And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests, and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great, uh, great. and he read 
in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. This is talking about the word of God. This is talking about the Bible. Up to that time period, up to that point in time, right? It says, and the king stood by a pillar. This is the king Josiah. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into the whole history. I just gave you a brief overview of what, who Josiah was. But it says, and the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord. So he's reading the words of the book of the covenant or the agreement. Uh, which was found in the house of the Lord, but now he makes a covenant and he made a covenant and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people stood to the covenant. So we see that Josiah leads by example and then he and they all make that commitment. And so what happens after this? So we see that Josiah is eight years old and he starts cleaning house for the Lord. But then they find the book in 2 Kings 23. And I mean, there's other uh, chapters that talk about this, but this is the one I focused on. You know, we see that uh, King Josiah, we're going to go back to verse four here shortly. But before that, let me skip to verse 13. He gets rid of everything to the point where he's going to look for anything that is not of the incorruptible, that is not of the pure word of God, that is not from the holies of holies, from the Lord. And then look, he goes to go down to 2 Kings 23 and go down to verse 13. It says, And the high places that were before Jerusalem, which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption. I mean, it's gotten so bad that there's literally a mount that is referred to as the Mount of Corruption. It says, In the high places that were before Jerusalem, were, that which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had builded for Ashtoreth, the, ab um, the abomination of the Sidonians, and for Chemosh, the abomination of the Moabites, and for Milcom, the abomination of the children of Ammon, that the king defiled. And what it, what it means is he, he got rid of it. He offended them. He said, No more. We're getting rid of all your false gods and all your corrupt ways. And, but when did this happen? When he, when he saw the power, when he felt the power, when he heard the power of the word of God, the incorruptible seed. You know, the, we, we cannot be saved through, in, uh, through corruption. We cannot lead others to Christ through corruption. It's just not possible. It's a, because it's not of corruptible seed. We're not going to get saved. We're not going to make great strides for God because through corruptible seed. It says not of corruptible seed. So if we were just to apply it, not of corruptible seed, and, and of course, you know, that's the verse, that, the, the section of the verse I took out, but we cannot lead someone uh, from a corruptible seed to the Lord. We cannot disciple them from a corruptible seed. We cannot do great things for the Lord from a corruptible seed. It's just not possible. And I'm going to prove that to you from the incorrupt Word of God, from the pure Word of God today, from the King James. You know, if you look there uh, in verse 4 of 2 Kings 23, verse 4, you know, the question begs, what does corruption of the world lead to? I mean, what does corruption of the Word lead lead to. So what does the corruption of, this, of God's word lead to? It leads to a lot. I could have used many scriptures in the Bible. I just focused on this because this was relevant to what I was uh, studying and what I was going to preach. But we could have taken this list from a numerous uh, passages in the King James Bible. And we see this pattern over and over again where the people of God have mercy from the Lord and they get overconfident and they fall away and they look to other places for their completion. And what happens is you end up with corruption in all aspects of life. If you get rid of the word, you know, the point, a good point to make here is, you know, they had to find the word of God. You know, it, it's hard to find a King James Bible in some Baptist uh, churches today. It's hard to find the King James Bible in some Baptist homes today. You know, I mean, one of the dangers of downloading these Bible apps is that if you're not grounded on the Word of God, you can get sidetracked with erroneous, corrupt Bible versions. 
You know, I mean, if you believe on God's word, then you're only going to use the King James. I don't like reading anything else unless it's to destroy it and use it as a point to make a point or prove that the corrupt, incorruptible word of God is the King James. But let's go there to verse 4 of 2 Kings 23. It says, And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priest of the second order, and the keepers of the door, to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal, and, and for the grove, and for all the hosts of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron, and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. And so I'm reading what they're getting rid of, but what does corruption of the word of God lead to? Well, the first point here in these subpoints is idols. What are they having to get rid of? They're the Hilkiah the high priest and the priest of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made to, to Baal. And specifically, idol worship in churches today. In our homes, in our Christian homes, we have idol worship that we need to get rid of. The only way we do that is when we start coming from a point, from a foundation of purity. Now, are we ever going to get rid of everything? Are we perfect? No. But we can definitely clean up our lives enough to where we have no idol worship uh, for in, in our lives or for our families. You know, let's keep reading there. Uh, and so we're reading in the Grove. And let's read verse 5. Uh, and it says, And he put down the idolatrous priest whom the king of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem, them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the hosts of heaven. And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem unto the brook Kidron and burned it at the brook Kidron and stamped it into small small and stamped it small to powder and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. And so we see that the second thing that corruption of the word of God leads to here in this example, that what are they getting rid of? They're getting rid of the idols. Now they're getting rid of the false prophets. It says he put out the idolatrous priests, the false preachers of the day, the people who all of a sudden infiltrate because there's no uh, purity and nobody has a, a, a barometer or a purified checklist to say, hey, this guy is a false prophet. This guy is a false teacher. This guy might even be a reprobate. This guy is not teaching the word of God, and you should not be in those pews, and you should not be behind the pulpit, and you should not be listening, or you shouldn't be preaching it. But we see here now, they know. They got the word of God, and they have a list, and they can, man, they can pinpoint these guys out. And then if you look, verse 7 says, and he break down the houses of the sodomites that were by the house of the Lord where the woman, women wove hangings for the grove. You know, most of your perversions try to change these words to make it more inclusive, to make it more accepted. For us, we separate. We don't want to do anything with the sodomites. We don't want to do anything with those uh, that leave the natural state of a man or the natural state of a woman. You know, one of the challenges is that it leads to the corruption of even the most pure thing. You know, here in Houston, a couple of months ago, they started, you know, and I think it's a, a trend that's taken on across the country, these, uh, you know, uh, tranny hours where they read, uh, you know, children's books to children in the library. A man dressed like a woman is sitting there confusing children and telling them, uh, reading them a kid's story about how it's okay to be like that. And that's corrupt in itself, but the most corrupt thing is that there's no filter system. You know, one of the things that popped up just recently this week here in Houston is we, people found out that one of the individuals that was doing this uh, drag queen hour, whatever they call it, was a registered child sex offender. You know, this, this individual is preying on the children and people are allowing him to speak to the children. And the reason that people are doing this is because they're corrupt in their manner. They're in the flesh. They haven't her not only not had the word of God preached to them, they've not only not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, or maybe they have. But nobody, you know, they're not going to a good Bible-believing church. They're not going to a church that preaches the word of God, God unfiltered. They're not going to a church that understands why the King James is so important for society today. 
You know, what is it? So they got rid of the idols. They get rid of the false prophets. Now they're getting rid of the reprobates. It says, and he break down the houses of the Sodomites. And I'm speaking specifically of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings for the groves. Now, there's other uh, individuals that can be uh, called reprobates, and I will be preaching that in a future sermon, but we know for a fact from Romans 1, and, and if you don't know that, read Romans 1 through and through, and a sodomite, a full-blown sodomite is a reprobate. Period. End of story. You know, and then what do we see next? Well, we go to verse 8, and it says, And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba and break down the high places of the gates that were in the entry in the in of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on a man's left hand at the gate of the city. Nevertheless, the priests of the high places came not up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they did eat of the unleavened bread among their, uh, among their brethren. And we see here that it leads to the corruption of cities, the towns, the political structure, the government structure. You know, what, why are we allowing uh, libraries to have, you know, these drag queen hours? Because our governments are corrupt. The city of Houston is one of the most corrupt cities in America. So corrupt that supposedly we're part of the Bible Belt, and yet somehow we managed to inaugurate and vote a few years back for the first uh, openly uh, lesbian mayor. You know, this woman who claimed to have left the natural use of the man and had a partner that was a woman was voted in to manage the third or run the third or fourth largest city in America. It's not because we stand on God's word. It's not because there's a lot of Republicans. It's because we've corrupted the word of God or we just choose not to have the pure word of God. And here, I mean, it's, it, makes, it makes perfect sense that we also have one of the, I mean, the largest megachurch in America, and they've corrupted the Word of God. And they've corrupted the message, and they've corrupted the, corrupted the gospel message, and, you know, they've just basically pure, putrefied, not purified, but putrefied the entire thing. You know, so let's keep looking here. Uh, verse 10 says, and, and he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinmon, that no man might make his son or daughter to pass through the fire of Molech, to Molech. And he took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the son at the entering in of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the chamberlain, which was in the suburbs, and burned the chariots of the son with fire. And the altars that were on top of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, the king beat down and break them down from thence and cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron. And the high places that were before Jerusalem, which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, there we see it again, which Solomon, the king of Israel, uh, had built it for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Sidonians, and for Chemosh, the abomination of the Moabites, and for Milcom, the abomination of the children of uh, Amen did the king defile, and he break in pieces the images and cut the groves, cut down the groves, and filled their places with the bones of men. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jer Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made, both the altar and the high place he break down and burned the high places and stamped it to small powder and burned the grove. And the final thing is we see that it leads to the attack on the innocent. You know, he says there that he didn't want, uh, that he got rid of places where they would allow their children to pass through the fire of Molech. You know, I mean, today in society, we have a two political party system, but they both serve the same God, and that's the God of this world, little g, that's the devil. Because there, there is no, uh, there is nothing in, uh, you can never convince me, in other words, and convince anybody that has a pure word of God that there is any stage in the gestation process, there's any stage since conception where it's okay to murder a baby. And you know, Josiah saw this after reading the word. I mean, he got rid of it. He was not going to go after the innocent. There's nowhere in there where it, in the Bible that it says it's okay 
to have someone who is unstable in all his ways access to your young, innocent children. It's just not going to happen. If you read God's Word, that's the thing that you want to keep away from your children the most. That's the thing that you're going to protect them from. You're going to protect them from any excuse to murder them in the womb, and then you're going to protect them from anybody who wants to abuse them and take away their innocence as they, as they grow up. You're only innocent and you're only a child once. You know, we can maintain some level of innocence once we get into the Word of God as adults. And I know some people have seen more and have, have had to live through more stuff, but once we get, come back to the Word of God and we get rid of it, look, if we're not putting it in our minds, out of sight, out of mind, but we're not going to clean this up if we don't have the Word of God. I mean, we see this here. We see this pattern that Josiah goes into where, let's just go back there real quick, uh, just for the sake. It says that they made this covenant when? It says, and the, ki uh, and the king, verse 2 of, uh, of 2 Kings 23, went up into the house of the Lord and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears, all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. Look, people tell me that they believe in God, but then they have questions, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to the word of God. I believe that if God can create you, a human being, a miracle that has matter and atoms and protons and neutrons and all kinds of biology and things that we can't, the vascular system and the mind and the feelings and the, how it all ties together. A God that can put that uh, engineering, that miraculous engineering into our bodies, how much more who could he not preserve the word of God? Because it's been preserved, you know, it was settled in heaven forever. I mean, we either believe that or we don't. You know, it, it, it causes, it causes uh, society to then start to doubt even our own creation. You know, that's why evolution has taken such wind, because we've corrupted the word of God. But it's not that way because if we're saved by grace, it's because it's from the incorruptible. It's from the precious blood of Jesus that knew no sin, who took on the sins of the world so that we wouldn't have to suffer that, you know, uh, eternal damnation. So we kind of, we've discussed how, you know, what corruption is, what it causes to society, what the corrupt word of God leads to. But now let's look at what, the incorrupt or the pure word of God leads to, you know, salvation and purification can only come from God's pure word, from God's incorruptible or uncorruptible word. You know, it, it, I just, I, you know, I've heard that argument back and forth, but the more I read the King James, the more I read the word of God, the more I see the results, not only in my life, but in the lives of others, there is no argument against it. Salvation can only come from the incorruptible. Corruption can't breathe uh, incorruption, but incorruption can get rid of corruption and breathe incorruption. It can clean it up. It's the only way. So we have to then stand on God's word. Let's go to Hebrews 7, verse 22. Hebrews 7, verse 22, and then we're going to be in 1 Corinthians, uh, you know, and then we're going to go just to Romans and Ephesians. But uh, Hebrews 7, verse 22 says, By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. So we see here that Jesus was made a better testament than the priests. And we started out with you know, Moses getting the Levitical law for the priests. But the challenge was with that is verse 23 tells us, And they were truly were many priests. Why was there so many priests? That's why we don't believe that you can be continuously in a state of being saved because there's no such thing. The Bible tells us that because you're once saved, always saved because here's the problem. And they, tru and, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered or allowed, is that, a, you know, it's another word for suffered, to continue by reason of death. In other words, at some point they were dying. But so guess what? You had to ordain another priest. And you had to ordain another priest. One day, you know, Pastor Cobb ordained me. One day, if God allows me, maybe I'll ordain a young man uh, or a few young men to the ministry. But the, why, why is that necessary? Because my time will end. 
you know, my time will come where I will no longer be able to preach. And one day I will no longer be on this earth. You know, so this is the challenge with, with men. This is the challenge with the corrupt body. This is the challenge with the uh, error of our ways, right? It says, but this man, speaking of Jesus, because he continueth for, he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. In other words, Jesus, being a high priest, never changes. He is, uh, you know, forever and ever. It says, wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. There's the salvation message again, just another way of saying, you know, he is the way, the truth, and the life. It says, wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Verse 26, for such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. So there we see it again, just one time. You know, that means there's only one word. That means there's only one God under heaven. That means there's only one uh, way to purify. There's only one incorruptible. You can't have several of these things, right? I mean, that's the way it goes. It says here, he didn't need to do it daily. And not only do it daily, but the high priest also had to do it for themselves. He didn't do that. He just offered it up once. Verse 28 says, For the law maketh men high priest, which have infirmity, or weaknesses, or sin, but the word of the oath, which was since the law maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore. And so we see here in Hebrews, that's talking about the eternal priesthood and high priest that just offered up once for the sins of the world, then that blood, that precious blood is what cleanses us from all sin. It's the pure blood. It's the unchanging, uncorrupted Word of God because He is the Word that can change lives forever. And, and that's so important because if we, if we want to get uh, other messages from the Word of God on how to raise your family, you know, on how to... Uh, be an effective soul winner, or how, why you should go soul winning, or you know why we need to preach the gospel of faith uh, through Jesus Christ, and why it's not of works. All this stuff it can only come from the Word of God. You know, and I, and I really wanted to drive the point and belabor the point from the King James itself, because I mean we can, and in the future I will give you other sermons. There's so many sermons we can do on the Word of God. I mean, honestly, I could probably spend a whole year just preaching on the importance of the King James, but I wanted to show you from the King James, because if I'm going to make that argument, well, we should start from the point of the foundation, from that rock on which we stand. You know, 1 Corinthians 15, go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35. It says, but some, but some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. See, when, we, when we're saved, it's because God has conquered death. And we're going to see that through Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ conquered death. And he died so that it, he could be quickened on the third day. And now he quickens us. And we're going to see that example. We're going to see how the... Uh, Everything after breeds after its own kind, right? And I didn't go to Genesis. We can, you know, go to Genesis 1 and 2, and you'll see that. But here we're going to see about the spirits and the different types of bodies and terrestrial. And let me not get ahead of myself. Verse 37 says, And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that the body that shall be, but bear grain, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds, everything after its kind. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. And notice... 
that it is sown corrupted, but it can't, that corruption cannot, but it says it is raised in incorruption. See, it's not corruption that sows other corruption. It's the incorruption. It's Jesus Christ. And we're going to see this. Let me not get ahead of myself. Verse 43, it says, It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul. That's why we die. That's why we, uh, you know, can't save ourselves. It says the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. We know that's speaking of Jesus. How be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. So first comes the, you know, uh, last week I was speaking about baptism, or earlier this week I was speaking about baptism, how you have to be born again, and you have to be born first of the wet, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Well, here we, we see that statement not only being backed up, but just reinforced. It says, how be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthy, the second man is of the Lord from heaven. And as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is heavenly, the heavenly, such also, I mean, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Verse 50. Now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. See, you just can't have it both ways. You know, I've heard that statement, you can't have your cake and eat it too. But you can't have, uh, you know, works and faith. You can, for salvation. You know, you have faith, and then faith, through Jesus Christ and the Word, then will help us produce better works. But most people want works, and then they want to kind of sprinkle a little faith and say that that is the salvation message, right? So when, when we go out soul winning, it's so important because if we're going to give the message, we better give it correctly because we now have taken on the duty and responsibility to tell others that there is a gift that's eternal, and we don't want to leave that confusing. We don't want to confuse the, the issue. It says in verse 51, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I've been struggling a little bit with my throat this week. <coughs> for this corruption must be must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. You can't have immortality with corruption. You have to have the incorruption. And then we see, uh, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as, for as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And I love that. You know, let's apply it to God's word. Be ye steadfast and unmovable, meaning this word does not move. It may be translated and preserved, but it is the same word. Right? And then the other thing is, that's what's going to then keep us always abounding in the work of the Lord. Then we know that our labor is not in vain. See, all other labor, corrupted labor, is in vain. So it has to be uh, through the Word of God so it's not in vain. Go to Romans 1, and then we'll just start to close this thing out. Go to Romans 1, verse 18, and then we'll be in Ephesians. But go to Romans 1, just a couple more instances where we see how the corruption can then just lead to idols. You know, we were talking about that, but also the, the false worship of false gods, the sodomy, the sodomites, the hatred towards God, the hatred towards God's word. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So, you know, the world, 
those that hate God, those that look to corrupt the word of God, they know or they see, they, they know the truth, but they hold it in unrighteousness. The only way to hold it in righteousness is through Jesus Christ. It says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. So they know, for the invisible thing, things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that they... Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish hearts was, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. See, these guys that want to corrupt the word of God, they say that they're scholars, PhDs, masters in, 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 in languages and linguists and whatever. But what they're doing is they're just professing themselves to be wise, but they're becoming fools says, and change the glory, here's the point, and they change the glory of the uncorruptible God and into an image made like to corruptible man. In other words, they're going to make it look and sound like what you want it to sound. And to birds and a four-footed beast and creeping things, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So it's very important that we focus on the Word of God because if, if we don't have the, the, the pure Word of God, then what we have is a lie. And nothing can be born of a lie. The only thing that can be born is more lies and more lies, eventually even murder, because Satan is the father of lies and murder. Now let's just go ahead and close this out. <coughs> Here we're going to see uh, in Ephesians 1, verse 12, it says, Verse 12 says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And, and I'm sorry, I'm taking my pen here because I just want to make sure that, I don't know, I'm just highlighting it for extra emphasis. It says in whom ye also trusted that ye have heard the word of truth. If you notice, the word of truth is tied to the gospel of your salvation. The incorruptible word is tied to the gospel of your salvation. You can't have the gospel of the salvation without the word of truth. In whom also after that ye believe were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance into the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. And so we see here that we're not of corruptible seed, that we, we don't, we're not born of a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You know, we see that corruption is the putrefaction, it's the decay, the wickedness, the moral uh, compass that just doesn't read right anymore. The, the, it, it doesn't have a good magnet. It's just making you go around in circles. It says how, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just messing things up. And then what it does is it leads to, you know, idols and false prophets and reprobates and corrupt city politics and corrupt uh, society. It leads to the murder and abuse of the innocent children. I mean, we see that just in Second Kings with Josiah, how he had to clean up the corruption of the land, you know. And then salvation can only come through the incorrupt word of God, through the pure word of God. And in our language, it's the King James. You know, I don't believe that you can lead somebody to, to Christ through a lie. It just, it's not possible because he's truth. And a lie, it, I mean, it just doesn't, it, they're opposites. They just, they can't have a fellowship with one another. Light can't, uh, you know, darkness can't lead to light. Because God, even in darkness, is light. So let's go ahead and, uh, you know, close out in a word of prayer. But just know that we need the King James. We need God's word, not only uh, as a message for the cleaning up of our lives, a message for walking right with God, a message for how we raise our families, for how we go about in our business, for how we make decisions, but more importantly, for how we go soul winning. If we don't have the pure word of God, how are we going to give a pure gospel message, a clear gospel message? So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to preach here tonight or this afternoon. And Lord, just uh, help us to stand on your word. Uh, and I hope that you just allowed me to give it some justice and make a good case for the fact that all we need is God's word to prove that that's your word. We don't need to go outside of, uh, of the King James. We don't need to uh, search 
scholars and PhDs and all these things. Uh, we just need the gut. We just need your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.